Good afternoon, everyone. If you could uh, move and grab a seat, please. There's lots of seats right up front with the tables. Um, if you want to uh, have a workspace, feel free to come on up front. Uh, there is an increased probability that you will be called on for a question if you do move up front. Part B is going to get the first question, so. All right, we'll start here in about 30 seconds. We'll go ahead and get started with the uh, initial opening comments. Um, feel free to uh, come on in at your leisure and grab a seat. Again, there's more seats up front if you would like to uh, head on in. Um, welcome to the Emergency Management Business Opportunity Session. Um, we got a great panel here today. Uh, I'm Steve Hill, uh, uh, fellow SAME. I'll be the moderator uh, here today. I'm with WSP, and we'll take questions uh, at the end of the session as well. And I'd like to touch on just a couple aspects of some uh, housekeeping. Um, the exit's obviously in the rear when you came in, because we have to go ahead and move out of the building. Uh, just head straight to the rear of where you're seating now. Um, if you would, pull your phone out. If you don't already have it out, at least just silence it. Uh, feel free, obviously, to go ahead and use that. Uh, the slides that you will see during uh, all of the presentations today will be made available uh, afterwards. Uh, so you'll be able to pull that information, but if you want to stand up, click a couple pictures, it's going to jog your memory or come on up here, uh, feel free to do that. Um, if you would like a photo with any of our panel members, um, I know that uh, they're willing to do that. We'll bring on up and uh, get to know uh, the panel and the distinguished team. And again, like I said, a Q&A uh, at the end. Um, I'll do the introductions here, and then we'll go through uh, several slide presentations, provide some information, and help with the training aspect. And then, as I said, uh, we'll go ahead and take questions at the end. And we'll take just about an hour, uh, 55 minutes or so here, and uh, wrap up uh, by the half hour. Uh, just a couple quick comments uh, on Steve Hill. Um, 
a former Army Corps of Engineer officer. I've had experience with emergency response down in New Orleans, uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, up in New York, and then also uh, down in Puerto Rico, most recently uh, working for General Holland uh, and the, uh, the Great South Atlantic Division. Um, I'm currently, as I mentioned, with WSP, working with architect engineer firm and work with an awful lot of small business and continue to support the emergency response space and community. So it's really an honor for me uh, to be able to participate uh, from having some experience in this space, uh, but really more of an honor uh, because of the great panel members that we have here and uh, my past good fortune have been able uh, to work with uh, each one of them. So first, all the way on my left and to your right, Major General Jeff Dorco retired. Uh, General Dorco serves as FEMA's Assistant Administrator for Logistics within the Office of Response and Recovery. He's been in that position for over five years and has key experience. Prior in his, in his current position, uh, he was the Director of the Office of Federal Disaster Coordination, where he worked with all of the field leaders, in including the Federal Coordination Officers and the Federal Disaster Recovery Coordinators. General Dorgo's public service started in the Army after graduation from the United States Military Academy. Uh, he was my division commander in Iraq. Um, sir, we probably won't ask you any war stories, but if you want to offer some, I know there's good and bad. We'd all love to hear. Uh, he commanded uh, the Great Southwest Division. I think uh, he's been smiling ever since he got back into the Great, sorry, Southwest. Southwest. West Fern Division. Uh, he's been smiling ever since he got back to the great state of Florida. Um, also in UCC served as the uh, Deputy Commander for Military and International Operations. He's got graduate degrees from George Washington University and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Uh, he's a great public servant, and I've been proud to know General Dorco for quite a long time and had the privilege of uh, working with him. He seems like one of those bosses that's a pleasure to work with, and you're absolutely right, because he's brilliant at what he does, and he appreciates his team, and he recognizes it. And we're gonna see some of that in his presentation uh, here today. Uh, just so we can run through all the panel members, uh, I'm gonna go through all of them, and then we'll start the presentation. Uh, round of applause for Jim Dorco, sir, thank you for being here. Actually, I was going to ask, um, what, what was the best experience that you've had in your career to date? Um, and you could cite a name or two, maybe somebody worked for you that you really thought was exceptional. <laughs> we'll go there. We'll be talking about when you left and who took your place. <laughs> or perhaps why you just like that job that you were at. So many people, I, I think I'm single digits out there, I think, of people I owe money to. Uh, so I don't want to, Frank Ward's case, I don't know which way it goes. Um, you know, best job I've had. I, I think the best job you have is the one you're in right now. You have two good, two great, you know, you have three now. You have an important job, you have the one you have now. I enjoy what I do. I, I mean, I loved every minute uh, of my service in the Army. I loved every minute in USACE, everything that I did. Um, I hope to get better, you know, with every job. And, and right now, you look back at me, boy, I wasn't all that good. I see who I sit next to here. I can't hold a candle to what they do, what Jeff does, what all the other folks out here who are division commanders do right now. I was talking to Tony Funkhauser earlier. Yeah, I hope to contribute to some small local resistance. It's, it's, um, it was a welcome opportunity to, to, after leaving military service, to be able to serve a nation. Um, what we do every day is to take care of disaster survivors before, during, and after not doing that, we're doing something wrong. Uh, and so I don't think there's any more sacred trust than what we all do out here as we serve the nation. We're to be able to continue to serve the nation, particularly when folks have had their worst day. Um, and, and try to pick them up and put them on the road to whatever the new, new normal is going to be and get them back to where they need to be. So I'm, uh, I'm thrilled uh, at my opportunity to have these jobs and all that I do. So that's, that's my answer. Thanks, sir. Our next panel member, thank you. The next panel member is Brigadier General uh, Kim Colleton. Uh, General Colleton is commander of South Pacific Division that's headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, she leads a workforce of over 2,300 
military and civilian staff that are delivering a greater than $5 billion military and civil works program. General Colleton was commissioned in the Engineer Regiment with a Reserve Officer Training Corps at Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute right up the road from where I grew up. She holds a Master's of Science in Civil Engineering from Stanford University and a Master of Science in Natural Resource Strategy from the Eisenhower School National Defense University. General Colleton completed a fellowship at the Rand for a Royal uh, Center in California and has done a great job of blending industry standards with the military systems and program, has been a great leader in the Army Corps of Engineers, and is a great leader in the emergency management and response uh, space by working from San Francisco, California, and a much larger um, area. General Colleton, what's been your best experience uh, in your career? Great question, but I'm going to take it from the perspective of a military operation. So I love the job of Navy SEAL Colonel. Um, I think of the South Pacific region, but we're really the Pacific Southwest. So it's being, you know, Texas, west of California, um, in the job, and then being uh, left to work at the most kind of heartbeat of all the people that we work with and have to guide, that are direct in response and um, um, serving serving the Navy uh, in the job and to be a supportive FEMA during the campfire uh, was really special um, and so we get to be with our you know the mission and this is our country uh, approach of we found our people um, and it's within our region first to be first responders go up and hold down the fort and then all the way as it goes beyond is what the county paramedic told me to go up and dedicated to go do after so when I'm up to be with that team both up in Butte County uh, supporting uh, people in the place of the campfire best moment was really talking to that team of people up there that we had pulled from all of our regional states and there were three people there that grew up in the area and they worked in our temporary housing uh, site to really put back their own roots you know because they're hungry and our hands were first where they went to community college where they grew up uh, people they knew and were first in their own community and so I think that's satisfying to know that we get to go do their community and to be able to not only you know help the regions but help uh, the people you know that are in service in our country is really a special honor for us. Thank you for joining us tonight. Major General Diana Holland is the commander of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers South Atlantic Division. South Atlantic Division is the regional business center in the southeast, the Caribbean, and the central in South America. General Holland led South Atlantic Division uh, during a response for hurricanes Irma and Maria, uh, where I was uh, proud to serve on her team to get to know her and the great team from South Atlantic Division and much broader Army Corps of Engineer team that was in support, uh, where we were working on emergency support function three mission as part of a corps-wide contract through FEMA. General Holland uh, led the response effort for Hurricanes Florence and also Michael, and prior to leading South Atlantic Division, she served as the Commandant of Cadets at the U.S. Army Military Academy at West Point. She's a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, has a Master of Arts from Duke University, a Master's of Military Arts and Science degree from U.S. Command and General Staff College and School of Advanced Military Studies, something that's very tough and challenging in our field. And ma'am, you've had a great opportunity to experience uh, recently wide variety of response efforts, but aside from that, aside from your current job, what rings, what rings most with you as the most difficult team, no, the best team, the best challenge you've had? It's not fair you can't pick a team, Mark. <laughs> I listened to you ask the question over here and I was all prepared, but, uh, well, so I'm going to answer the way I want to, which is, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I would not uh, say one assignment is better than, than the other, but I will say about this one, this is my first assignment in the Army Corps of Engineers. 
uh, despite the fact that I've been an engineer author uh, for 29 years, I have never had an opportunity to cross over into youth studies. And when, when General Semini came to me in my last job and said, I want to bring you to the Corps, I said, sir, you're tracking that I've never been in the Corps before. And he said, that's all right. You, know, you need to come over and, and get this experience. And, and all I can say is I'm at the two, almost two and a half year mark in this job. And, and I would never imagine that I would have a special as, as assignment and one that is as inspirational as this one has been uh, at this late in my career. So it's been, and part of it has to do with the amount of work I've been able to do in emergency management and uh, the joy and the reward that I've, that I've gotten in watching core employees and our partners, FEMA and our contractors help fellow Americans in this woman's greatest need. And before we start, just a pause, because, you know, I was telling the uh, panel, um, I know many times you don't want your bio read. You, you know who you are. You know what you've done. But as I went through and prepared and looked at the bios and looked back at history of the panel members, it's pretty phenomenal. Over 100 years of experience between them doesn't mean we're getting older. It's just an awful lot of experience that's brought to the table. So the bios are on the SAME Small Business app. You haven't loaded the app, pull it up. Uh, take a look at the bios. Look for some common connections. And I've belabored the point a little bit. We're doing more than bios. At least having each one of the panel members say something about that. Because I think what's important with the challenges that the nation faces is to understand the leadership that's in the public service, like the panel members here, like us that are supporting your efforts, to build confidence in the way this nation will continue to respond to emergencies. And we'll do that by bringing the whole team together, and that's something that SAME is about. So thanks for the opportunity to do the introduction, a little bit extra. Ma'am, I didn't mean to throw you a wild card, but I know you're going to answer uh, the best possible. Sir, you're first up, if you would. You have the clicker. I'm going to walk in. I, I would normally tell Bill Dorco that he's not going to be allowed to walk around. But okay. Say, let's just let him walk around. Yeah, I can't see that. Hey, you know, thanks a lot. So uh, this is going to be easy. I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes. So I'm going to be the context setter here. Um, and so, you, you know, so you get the logistics guy out of FEMA. You have the recovery guy doing all the thorny stuff in Puerto Rico right now. Can't, wouldn't want to try to answer any of those questions. Yeah, but, but what I want to do is quickly just create some context for you, let you know how you, how you reach out to us, how you relate to us. You're going to find out how you relate to us and how you relate to us as the convener of the federal government for how we respond to disasters. And we'll get into a lot more specifics uh, you know, for those, those who follow me here. So I, you know, create some quick context, make a couple points, because I would rather have a dialogue and have your questions and take your questions and, and where they lead us. So, you know, I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with FEMA? How do you how to do business with FEMA? This is going to be very straightforward. I know you're going to get these, these slides. About the next 10 slides have just a bunch of information. I'm going to blow through it. I've got like 200 flyers up here that I'm going to leave that's going to be uh, the same information, and I know these slides will be available to you afterwards. And understand, when you see this, ooh, this is like 101 as to how you contract with the federal government, you realize, yeah, the procurement folks put this together. And in a lot of cases, we deal with folks who aren't used to contracting with the federal government. You know, the Defense Production Act clauses that are in contracts or whatever when you're dealing with manufactured home producers or subcomponents down the supply chain or whatever, it's a, it's a little bit different. So. A lot of this is really basic. I want to fly through it, but there are a couple things I want to want to stick on here. Give you my two cents worth on the on the disaster business. Yeah, yeah, and four easy steps how to get there. It, it's it's the stuff that you already know. You need to make yourself known to the community out there. You need to understand the context, uh, you know, world that you're going into, and, and where to look for opportunities and who to reference when you get to them. You know, the next slide. Um, you know, register, you know, the Dunn's number, you know, register and Sam. I mean, you've all, you know, you all understand. I'd never had an appreciation for Dunn and Bradstreet data until recently. That's another story we'll have here toward, toward the end as, as we start to look more and more at the private sector capabilities. And that's a kind of a theme related to procurement uh, and contracting opportunities, but kind of not. Um, you know, understand our mission. FEMA is unique in a way that, I mean, we operate under the Stafford Act. So you want to get smart on what FEMA can do or can't do, you just you read the Stafford Act and we'll understand what we're all about. We're, we're all about responding to disasters, you know, in the United States and its territories. Um, so that's, you know, the Caribbean, that's the Virgin Islands, that's the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, 
That's the, uh, the 50 states. That's Guam, Saipan, Tinian, and Rhoda. Uh, Guam and the Confederation of Northern Marianas Islands and American Samoa. Um, so all those areas, and, and I'll tell you what, the last couple of years, you know, Saipan has been a drill. It is 9,000 miles from Washington, D.C. to Saipan, and that gets really hard you know, when 60,000 people were impacted the way they were by Super Typhoon U2 of this, this past year, or just about a year ago when it impacted, actually at the end of October uh, of, of last year. So the Stafford Act is what we're all about. Obviously, we interact with other government agencies through the Economy Act, but the Stafford Act and the National Response Framework drive how we operate in this in in this business and who we relate to, because again, you know, FEMA's mission, you know, we are a convener of the capabilities of the federal government and well, basically the whole of community out there to response to to respond to disaster survivor needs. You know, we do we take care of disaster survivors before, during, and after disasters, and in the end, you know, that second bullet, state emergency management agencies, the governor is in charge. That's the governor of the state, the territory, the commonwealth, you know, tribal leadership. You know, tribes have equal standing now in the emergency management business. They can ask for declarations on their own, do not need to be subordinate to the states in which they reside where the disasters have impacted. But those governors or those tribal leaders, they are the ones that call the shots. They are the folks that we are supporting to take care of their disaster survivors who just had a real, real bad experience talk about this for a minute. I told you we are a convener of capabilities of the nation. And if you want to, you know, light reading at night, you'll read the National Response Framework that will show you how we organize for combat, in a, in a, in a, in a manner of speaking, to, uh, to deal with disasters. And if you can point out to what's wrong on this slide, the emergency support function 14 is no longer that. It hasn't been that for years. It's something new, and I'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, look to ESF3, Public Works and Engineering. That's where the Corps of Engineers is our critical partner and the most critical partner in the emergency management business. I think somebody did a chart once. It was a big block, and it was the area inside that block that was you could either measure it by dollars, numbers of mission assignments or tasks that went out, and like 80% of the block was the Corps of Engineers. The entire rest of the government, the rest of DOD, the rest of all of government brought in, you know, it's a pales in comparison to what the core does. So you know, we want to leave the time you know, to talk about what the core does for us in the public works and engineering area, which is largely I know why you're here. But you can see there are a lot of other areas there. ESF-7 uh, is co-led by us, me, and uh, the General Services Administration, co-lead the, uh, the logistics uh, business. And then you can see other agencies that are out there. So uh, in terms of contracting and contracting opportunities, do we do a lot? Yes, we do. But we operate through other agencies too. So you may, we may go get food uh, for infants and toddlers from the Department of Agriculture through standing contingency contracts and capacities that they have. The Corps of Engineers does a lot for us. We'll talk about generators and blue roof sheeting and a whole bunch of other stuff that we've done and experienced for the better or worse over the last couple of years and restoring power and doing a whole bunch of things. All these other agencies are, uh, are the, the agencies listed there are the leads in those emergency support functions. They have other government agencies and departments and, and organizations that support them, but they're the ones that carry the water in, in that regard. Um, how do you get to us? You get to us just like anybody else. We advertise on FedEx Ops and we do contracting with FAR, if it like, like everybody else should, uh, should, should be doing. Um, I'm, the, I'm a logistics guy. A large part of what we do is to support the logistics effort. Yeah, I was heartened when the, 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 the administrator came in and said, hey, where's the logistics guy? Because in the end, you know, we have the flood insurance program. We have all sorts of grant programs. All FEMA is a big grants agency, right? In the public uh, assistance realm for public works that are out there and for individuals and households. In the end, we give money away. But in, in a small way, dollar value is the, is the logistics function and response is all about logistics. And unless we win the battle of response to keep American citizens alive and healthy and safe going forward, then what does the rest of that granting operation matter if we haven't been able to take care of folks? And that's where a lot of these commodities come in, and that's what we contract for out there most directly in FEMA. And we have standing contracts. We have ATOX, ATOX, IDIQs out there that do this, that give us contingency contract capability. And we have 10 distribution centers scattered from Guam uh, to Hawaii, back to the lower 48, out to, uh, to the Caribbean, where we store a lot of this stuff. And then we rely on extra contracting capacity, even to get our own stuff, largely with the Defense Logistics Agency, maybe more than anybody else, but also with GSA, and, and the Corps provides us that capability also. 
Um, you know, what we do, I won't talk about the rear removal. I'm guessing maybe we'll, we can talk about that a little bit later. I want to talk about transportation. You know, Steve's going to ask one of those questions. What keeps you up late at night if we have time at the end or whatever? I'll tell you what keeps me up late at night, two things. One is the catastrophic. This nation has not faced a catastrophic disaster yet. Uh, so what we had in 2017 when you had uh, Harvey hit Texas, you know, the biggest rainstorm in North American recorded history, and then we had Irma hit St. Thomas, come up and go through Florida, then we had Maria come through. Those played out in space and time nicely in a way because we were really stretched to be able to deal with that. That was not the catastrophic. You know, the catastrophic is New Madrid seismic zone. Everybody know, anybody know, you know what the New Madrid seismic zone is? Seismic event, earthquake event. You know, in the Northwest, it's the Southern Cal earthquake, the big one in Southern California. I was just reading some stuff in a book that a guy is asking me to review right now, Cascadia. Cascadia, in terms of, um, you know, just kinetic, straight kinetic energy, could be 30 times bigger than the big one in South, uh, uh, than Southern California. So, you know, terrible, terrible numbers and consequences involved. We haven't faced that yet. We've got to be ready for that. There's no way the federal government will ever have that capability. How do we get that capability? We mission sign with our partners, but we build capacity through you all out there and bring the nation's capabilities to bear because the private sector's ability to do things, provide things, and step up is infinitely bigger than anything the government does. That's why we contract for it. That's why we're here. That's why this conversation is so critical. A um, few helpful tips, you know, Fed biz ops, all those things. How to contact us. That's... You'll get this out of this, this flyer I'm going to leave with you here. I will tell you, I, am, I really, really like our, our contracting shop. And if you get into FEMA industry at fema.dhs.gov, you will, you will get access to the agency. You have some question, you have something you want to offer, a new way of doing things. Believe me, send them an email telling them what you want to do. It will get into the system, and it gets to me. It works. It's a system that works, and it's a system that leaders in FEMA pay attention to. So when somebody comes up, I have a better solution. Why do you have all these meals that sit on the shelf and expire after three years? I've got a better solution to that. Why do you do these HUD-compliant, really expensive, manufactured housing units as a housing solution for disaster survivors? I've got a better way of doing it. Get it in there because we pay attention to it, and they convene the right people together, and this protects us both because you don't know whether we're anticipating an acquisition or not, and we're not really sure what you're bringing to the table. When you go through the industry liaison office, it keeps us all safe so that nobody's excluded from competing for something later on. It's just a great way to work. It's a great system. It, believe me, you know, trust me, it does work, and, and use it because you know, it'll, it'll benefit us both. Last thing, and then I'm going to stand down is uh, I do logistics, but I do one more thing now. Um, FEMA, for the longest time, had a small office in our public affairs organization uh, that, was the uh, that was a private sector office. It amounted to an industry liaison office. Uh, that's been moved out of our public affairs organization, given me in the logistics world. Uh, we've retitled it. We had a contest. We drew names from my hat. I forgive her how we did it. But we're calling it the Office of Business, Industry, and Infrastructure Integration. This is high-level integration. You know, the whole idea is, I told you, the, the capabilities of America are far greater than anything can, government can bring to bear. What we want to do as an agency, one, is stay out of your way if you're in the impacted area and letting you restore, get business back to business. Uh, you know, we, you know, we know that we get in the way a lot. We want to avoid that. Second thing, what can we do to enable you to restore the supply chains or the businesses or whatever that you do and bring that back, back to, to life? And then we want to align better. The federal government needs to partner with the private sector uh, so that it's all of us together that will do the right thing for the American citizens who have been, who've been impacted by the disaster out there. This the National Business Emergency Operations Center is probably, it's the portal to the outside world. So I would offer that if you're not part of this, you might want to sign up or you might want to get online and look at these websites and see what it's all about. Because during a disaster, they're up online a couple hours or maybe an hour. We try to keep it to an hour a day. You know, we, we have websites and we have conference calls where we have thousands listening in, where we get the word out as to what's going on, where we get feedback and have dialogue with industry out there as to what you can do and how we can do it better together. Uh, and the National Business EOC, a really, really powerful tool that we've added to our kit bag now. And we're going to expand on this in terms of our outreach to industry at a very high level. Again, this is intended uh, to figure out how we stay out of your way and then how do we uh, help you get back to get business back to business so a couple things you know 
Keep paying attention to the industry liaison office. That's how you get to us for contracting things, for ideas. And, and please become part of the partnership that is the National Business uh, Emergency Operations Center. It's a system uh, that, that works right now. We have a long ways to go, but I think this, this portends the greatest potentialities you know, we have out there for, uh, for being able to take care of disaster survivors. We're only going to do it if the whole nation is locked up and lined up and, and in arm in arm uh, going forward to take care of things. So uh, I'll leave it at that. That was more than five minutes like I promised you that I would do. Uh, but, I'll, but I'll pass this off, but I would love to have a dialogue after, afterwards uh, to hear your concerns or to talk about what you want to talk about in the disaster business. Ma'am? focus in on youth based and emergency management opportunities. Uh, we have a few slides here. We're going to go through them kind of quickly, not uh, go through in, in them in great detail because what's important is that we get to the questions at the end, what you want to talk about. But before I get started, if I could just see a show of hands of who in here uh, contractors, businesses has actually uh, been a contractor under the federal government, uh, particularly the Portland area. I'm sure we have a century audience. Okay, wonderful. So we already have a lot of experience with this. And then also, if if uh, any contracting folks from the Corps of Engineers, if you would stand up real quick, just so the audience can see who you are. All right, so. <laughs> all right, thanks everybody. So I just wanted to do that real quick, one, to get a sense of the audience, and two, if you have any real hard questions, you know who to go to. Uh, ask at the end of the briefing. So, um, but no, we appreciate your time in, in coming to this. Our two regions, of course, the South Pacific Division and the South Atlantic Division had our share, not the only ones uh, dealing with, with disaster, but certainly have had our share in the last two to, to three years. Uh, and we would not be successful, uh, well, we wouldn't be able to do the job were it not for contractors. Most of the services are provided by contractors. And I would say we can't do it well if we don't have contractors that are informed, flexible, and empathetic. And I use the word empathetic because while, of course, this is a business opportunity and, of course, you have to make decisions uh, and guide your company uh, to support profit, if you do sign on to do something in emergency management, uh, realize this is about solving some pretty big problems. Uh, humans dealing with human suffering, and it does require a little bit a different set of skills in order to do this well. And so that's the kind of partnership that, that we look toward uh, when we get into emergency management. And before I talk specifically about our role under FEMA, I also want to highlight that we don't just hire contractors and do emergency management under the staff act under FEMA. We are going to focus on that today, but the Corps' mission in emergency management really fits into three things. One is uh, under FEMA, the Stafford Act, uh, but number two would be the, our authority under USAID, right? So no matter what everybody else is doing, we have certain functions that we're going to have to do to respond to emergency, just as whether it's flooding or it's our civil works project. We're going to be doing those things regardless of the decisions that the state and FEMA make. And then the third one would be uh, support the DOD, installations, recruiting centers, things like that. All of the things that we do to support the Department of Defense and the other services. So there are a lot of opportunities. We aren't going to cover them all here. We are going to focus uh, a lot on the FEMA mission. So uh, General Durko mentioned emergency support function number three, for which the Corps, the Corps is the coordinator for that, public works and, and engineering. Uh, and these are the official roles. These are the predetermined roles that we provide and services that we provide under FEMA. And again, we've had our share of them in the last three years. We've had record numbers of installing, uh, doing the temporary emergency power missions uh, for two or three years now, debris removal, Blue Roof, um, but also, you know, with a title such as Public Works and Engineering, you can just imagine all of the things that come along with it. So it's not going to just be these functions. And the most visible, most pronounced example of that, you might say, non-standard mission 
would be the one to rebuild a power grid in Puerto Rico. That was unplanned, uh, not listed here under uh, under EFF3, and it's pretty massive, very expensive mission. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and transition to Kim, which is going to dig down a little bit further into the individual contracts that we've performed in this particular case. Um, this is a couple of things we need to get home that have to do with the area of the city as well. <coughs> but this is a big opportunity. We're going to help install a PX3 in the Mountain Lake area um, that we put in Brooklyn. Um, but really, it's our very small businesses that are going to get hit. And the opportunity really needs to be here at A6 uh, to be rather uh, relevant for what it is going to be sponsored um, to be a good first step. And I think that kind of take the road that I've taken now and come back at it and be one of the handy investment groups. And with the groups we have out there, the people they need to come in, uh, we rely on not only some of the advanced contracting and leasing I'm going to talk about, but the relationships and your success and what you have here that you have back in the neighborhoods and communities and homes that we live and operate from um, that really get to know the contracting officers districts in our region, and then knowing your capabilities, um, they have a short list of files and they'll just call upon the community, and that's really the sponsor. And to have these contracts I'll talk a little bit about, but the other way we get at things is really having that, and the reason why we have a lot of standing but Tom can speak on this, is the reason why we've done so many luncheons um, out there in the community and standing events, is to get to know the capabilities of those business contractors, what are their uh, skills and knowledge abilities and are ready and want to sign up to become part of this type of group. And I think it's really important for businesses to come from the industry uh, to get close to each other and really show up and get to know folks and tell them what you can deliver. Because uh, that list, uh, that, that list of, of opportunities um, is going to come. They're going to look through it and say, hey, let's, let's call on so-and-so, 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 and you're ready and you're willing and and that's how a lot of these um, tasks are handled from the people that they get to work with. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, so the disaster response. We do get a large majority of our mission assignments and funding through FEMA. And as Ms. Uh, Holland mentioned, and I'll talk at the end, some of those uh, funds also come through um, to our own uh, flood control and coastal emergency people work well. But through FEMA, we have some stuff we reimburse, some advanced contracting leases. So in three of those, I'm going to dive down into it a little bit. Emergency power, debris management, and temporary removal. And then some of the non-standard, uh, uh, and we have those in place because we want to have reserves, responses, uh, capacity um, at a bigger level that's pretty coordinated. Uh, but again, I can't say enough about those other uh, opportunities for small businesses to be ready to respond to things they can't plan for and the net uniqueness of steps, things that you don't exactly know how it's going to um, unravel or what's going to be needed, and it's more tailored to to a particular location and a particular disaster. So one of those is like temporary housing. And so we get very frequent need of temporary housing, uh, and it comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. But if you take a site and set up some utilities and some power and some platforms that are coming to stand and get trailer rentals, housing units in place uh, for those folks that need it. Folks in Northern California can come to Wild Pulse. So it's not a prepackaged advanced contract initiative, but it's an initiative that we make and we're able to contract with really local small businesses to come in and do that and to our local base. That one in particular was in Sacramento District. Um, so those are unique and they're very standardized to what we want the state to do uh, with the local county uh, needed to be able to respond to those uh, communities that are distressed. And there's a, a, a wide variety of those. It happened in uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, superintendent of the New York City Surveys on underwater uh, watering, um, and there's a variety of those that, that we can all think of. I would also um, mention that um, non-standard mission sets are really what are the relationships that can come in and talk about what you can provide and how you can do that, that need. And that's where that one-on-one -on -one dialogue is 
not be explicitly introduced to address the impact of the injury, but it fully allows you the opportunity to do peer review. The first element I've down is here, this is one of those, these are the pre, uh, pre-strike or pre-set contracts to prepare for big G, you know we're going to need and you, you want to have the data on yourself. So Mercy Tower contract, um, a few sort of sort of work, uh, Cove Resort, Pittsburgh District is our lead um, under our Lakeland Service Division for that. And so if you have any specific questions, you know, absolutely we're going to volunteer you to be around to address it. Um, but the temporary tower mission, uh, utilized in Puerto Rico and this is in the Hong Kong area just as you may see we have three of them are the ones that we have um, on the ground in Puerto Rico and this is in Barcelona and so that is a historically significant time in the year we applied that temporary power contract but basically we're putting generators out to provide power for critical facilities that the state um, for FEMA hasn't set aside um, and when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago back in San Francisco um, we are doing some local uh, Defense Department civil authorities exercises, and it happened to be during, during fleet weekend. We do this every year, and it happened to be the time that they started to see some uh, potential fires and some high winds, and the Pacific Gas and Electric Community started shutting down and telling people to start shutting down the power in a lot of Bay Area communities. And so it just happened that we were practicing at a time and talking, and, but this is a real thing happening. What are those critical facilities? Do we know what they are? And what do we need to do? What do we need to have to ask for help uh, to be able to continue to provide those critical facilities, hospitals, um, uh, medical facilities, um, police stations, you know, the proper backup power for them so that they don't have it. And so that was a wake-up call, I think, to us. Not that we didn't know about it, but it really happened. And when I had about three days ago, I think we knew. We definitely know that this is, this is in high demand. Um, So in this particular uh, ACI contract, um, they've already been awarded, and I, I just, the fine print, you can't really see it, but Lee Berger, WSP, um, the gentleman to my far right here, um, he can talk this a little bit. So they've already been awarded, they're in June of 2019, uh, solicitation said that had went out, this is what had occurred, and Lee Berger has a four uh, regional contract, um, but that still leaves a lot of opportunity for subcontracts. And so they are really looking hard uh, to beef up their providing opportunity to, to small business and to subcontractors. And so that's an opportunity that is still to be had. Um, the contracts are in place for uh, at least a year, plus two potential um, opportunities. And so just want to let you know about that. The next one I'm going to talk about is temporary mission. I'm going to hit that briefly. Um, Omaha District, and there are three chiefs, Evans is out there, as well as um, Cindy Zimmer from Omaha. They're the three for the temporary pre-event contract this year. Um, and they have a lot going on. They are going to um, put out 20 new solicitations um, in the January time frame. So these are not on the street yet. These are the current ones are going to expire in May of 2020. Um, but 10 for FY for fiscal year 20 and 10 more uh, for fiscal year 21. And of those uh, 10 for next year, four of them are going to be small business uh, set aside. And so definitely we want to take advantage of that opportunity to talk to them and get to know exactly um, what that involves and what the criteria is going to be. But that is they're definitely regionally set up. Um, they cover a variety of states from the Atlantic Coast states uh, to the Gulf Coast um, and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And so depending on where you're located and what, um, you know, regions that you feel you are in a position to cover, um, they, uh, they have some opportunity coming up in the future. Next one is debris management. And this is obviously a, a big one. And debris management is complicated and complex. Uh, debris is a falls behind hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, wildfires, earthquakes. Debris is concrete, it's steel, it's hard, it's vegetation, um, trees, mudslides. Um, it's everything you can imagine. And it's hazardous waste, um, it's um, toxic waste. It's, it's really difficult. I mean, you're removing debris from not only major roadways um, and public, you know, access areas, but personal uh, property, people's 
home gives me even more confidence to keep working on it. Like, try to keep doing it. And we saw that in the wildflowers the last few years. Um, and every area is different. So the complexities of dealing with the environment, removing the hazardous waste, and where do you put it? Is the landfill, is the landfill happening after you work with it? Um, especially with the significant amount of waste that's been generated um, with the fuel detoxification provision. And these ACI contracts, um, we have used them heavily um, across you know, the tanks at the West End. Um, and so right now, uh, the contracts are about to expire in April of 2020, and we are pretty much out of capacity. There's only a small amount of capacity that is left right now to do some additional scoping, um, and we will work out some way to, to try to extend them for as long as possible. Um, but in the in the near future, so right now, um, the East Coast to West East solicitation for the new contracts have already gone out, and the uh, selection reviews are ongoing, and the intent is to award these um, in the January, February, March timeframe, the second quarter of the fiscal year. And Wendell, um, Norman, Mississippi Valley Division, Columbus out here, Scott, um, Harris, they're from uh, Mississippi Valley Division, they're the lead for our drain contract, so we have some questions. So even though the solicitation went out and the proposals are in and they're being reviewed, again, if you're not one of those, if you're one of those, you'll be interested to know that these can be made out and then bring them first or the second quarter of this this fiscal year. Um, but also, once those are made, there's also subcontracting opportunities for that. which is local uh, under use safety authority, not through FEMA, for pre-flood, during flood, and post-flood event. And it is going on all across the country. Again, go talk to your local district, your local district contracting officers and district commanders. Um, but through the public law 8499, um, you get funding and a separate um, supplemental to do those repairs. And those kind of projects, this is for inner control in my region, we have um, about 15 uh, potential rehabil levy rehabilitation projects that are going to happen you know, over this next year that range from $100,000 to $25 million. And so repairing breaches that occurred from flooding from 2017 and 2019 floods. The Northwest has a lot of levy repairs ongoing. So that's work that that's in your business line. You know, go talk to uh, those local districts and those contracting officers to see what you can provide to get in and do some of that work. So I'm a, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and move to a um, couple slides ahead here. So the, the takeaway from this slide is th this is the money that had come uh, uh, from Congress as part of recovery. So a, a hurricane or any kind of storm or disaster is not just about the initial response. It's, it's about the recovery that can take years beyond and the money that, that we in the Corps get in order to do a lot of the repairs or make the state or territory more resilient. So two major supplementals in the last couple of years, one that resulted from uh, season, our hurricane season, uh, natural disaster season of 17, that was about $14 billion that the Corps received in order to do long-term recovery. And then uh, 2018 storms, the Corps re is receiving over $3 billion in order to do some of that long-term recovery. And if you look just at Puerto Rico, uh, there alone from the, from 17 disasters, they're getting, you know, two point, we are doing $2.5 billion worth of work over the next few years in Puerto Rico. So this isn't just, there aren't just opportunities in the initial response, there are opportunities that can be out there uh, for years. And another example of DOD installation, Kimball Air Force Base that sustained catastrophic damage from Hurricane Michael, uh, will be in the range of uh, well, just over $3 billion and build that type of work that we're going to be doing there to restore that. So actually, I think this is probably one of the most important slides, and I really wanted to get to it, and I, and I wanted to uh, uh, mention Steve uh, in this particular, on this particular slide, because his idea when we participated in the panel a year ago to talk about what are some of the takeaways of the relationship between the Corps and our contractors. What did we learn from it? What are some 
PPP uh, that we can share that worked or didn't work. And first and foremost, and I've already covered it, this is a team effort, a family affair. We cannot do it alone. Um, and we can, we must work together and we'll be successful and, and do this well if we work together in an informed way. Uh, furthermore, understand that this is a different environment. This is not business as usual. It can be, we can have austere, in an austere environment, harsh conditions, uh, but the, the willingness to go the extra mile to help our citizens in need is very critical uh, in this. And then um, I guess the other thing I would share, and I'd ask uh, Steve to jump in, uh, there are some things that you can do if you haven't worked for the federal government, particularly in an in emergency management role, uh, the preparation for that. And, and first of all, realize, so I guess one thing I would share is when I came out of the 17 hurricane season, I got a lot of feedback from our contractors of how difficult it was. That was to be frank, uh, the criticism that we, you know, we, there's a lot of paperwork demands um, and it made it very difficult. Can't we just get rid of some of that bureaucracy? And the answer is no. And when you sign up to work for us, and even in those environments, the answer is no, because we do have to comply with the FAR. Uh, we get audited. We get, you know, lots of reviews of our paperwork to show how we responsibly, we were responsible to a, a taxpayer dollars, a very large amount. And so just go into that with eyes wide open, understanding uh, what that means to work for us. No, I, I would just comment and really piggyback on two quick things here because uh, while the uh, the missions follow through ESF-3 from FEMA down to the core, as was already mentioned, uh, we participated in response in support of South Atlantic Division, but there is the contracting side as well, and it's a partnership that really is pretty phenomenal uh, with Pittsburgh District with Colonel Shorten and his team, and it's ongoing to understand the requirements uh, by the contract, and then in addition to that, the partnership and the coordination that needs to be done. And in continuing that to flow down to really this team here relevancy is the small business side of it. And Chris Wolf, if you would go ahead and stand up. Chris Wolf is for WSP. He's our procurement contracting and small business lead. Uh, we have a responsibility to engage directly with small business on the temporary power ACI contract, and this is a great form and opportunity to do it. So in addition to following and, and talking to the folks up here, uh, talk to Chris, talk to Colonel Short, but I think it's the preparation and the early engagement of talking now, uh, just as General Holland is talking about, that allows us to put the conditions, set the conditions for success when the small events occur, and there's none small if you're impacted, or the very large or catastrophic uh, that General Durko references. Thanks, ma'am. And I think I can back up to one thing that's been good. Thank you. And we look forward to your questions. So if I could. If Lieutenant Steyer and uh, Captain uh, Matthews, I'm going to grab both of these two. We can take a couple of questions here. We're done on the half hour, but uh, we've got just a little bit of flexibility. Uh, so show of hands uh, with questions. Yes, sir, right down here in front. Uh, sir, and panel, thanks. My name is um, Daniel Morales, retired Sergeant Major, United States Army, Infantry, 82nd Airborne Division. Very versed mm -hmm. in my primary next code is 541990. Emergency management. I'm trained in NISCA, DISCA, trained by MNERC, Lawrence Livermore Lab, Sandia Lab, FEMA certified under the SEBA, SIPMA, VAPO. I've done the Bay Area exercise, force assessments in California, and last, the Cal ISO grid system. I participated in Katrina. Very, very familiar from the green side, Sergeant Major working on it, but now this for vets and service disabled vets. One of the things that my question that I have because I've had this experience, is that the cost lighting and cost escalation, especially when it comes to emergency response. I'll give you an example. Currently, you say for your generators, for right now, fuel price, gas wise, can be set one price, but then yet it changes to $4 in 10 cents an hour. And I came with this experience of what happened in California with the wildfires, and we had to get out generators and things of that nature. One of my recommendations, given because I'm very, I'm very versed with the FAR, is that exercising the alternative line items 
to be able to exercise those pot escalations and put in that emergency line of it. But moreover, how do you get guys like myself? I'm a service disabled vet, pretty well versed in training, so that way I can get onto your teams and be able to get some of these contracts. Because one, one of my goals, just like that colonel down there, uh, Colonel T is the Marine Corps over Colonel. We want to be able to get onto these contracts because we're very good. It's about response, mitigation, life, a property, and values. But we don't want to bid in, into a contract where we don't have that flexibility. And under the emergency uh, acquisition of 18, it gives us those pauses. Again, we're looking at something with the VA because they're required to be able to get their facilities um, uh, certified under the FEMA. But we're very familiar with the FEMA under uh, as a J3 sergeant major in plans and operations for security. Um, what can we do for the service disabled vet to get onto some of these contracts? And, get and then bring value to how we can bring something as far as cost line items and escalation. So our major, if I can take the first shot. Sure. Um, yes, sir. First Thank of all, you, sir. thanks for your service. Okay. Uh, go 82nd. Cool. Um, please talk to Mr. Chris Wolf, and you tell him you want to be on FEMA and the Corps of Engineers team through WSP if it's time for temporary power. The broader picture is to participate in the additional acquisition procurements that are coming out. Airborne, sir. Ma'am? Sir? Can I just add and confirm for him our delivery of aircraft and fuel to him and that will be easier. Um, so that's an opportunity uh, where we could secure a site for you to work with the FEMA team to do that. Roger that. And I also am available for photographs except for gray hair just like you do, sir. Cool. Right down here, there's another one. Uh, yeah, my name's Caleb. Uh, what would be your biggest piece of advice for somebody just getting into the federal contracting? Uh, we own a roofing company, so the FEMA blue tarps right up our alley. Uh, what have you, what, what's contractors done in the past that bugs you or irks you? Um, the one takeaway. <laughs> Nobody get too fired up. Uh, <laughs> now she's going to answer know, my question. Um, <laughs> well, so. So first of all, I mean, it's a really tough environment when the demands are as high as they are, and we're being very demanding, and, and, and uh, the public is being very demanding, and, the, and so it is very tough. Um, I would say, I, I can't think of something that irked me in particular, but I would just go back to working closely with us, with the core, with those who are overseeing the core, if you're working for us, and you, you would be if you're doing the Blue Ridge Commission, uh, is to work closely with us and understand uh, where the demand signal is at, and if and um, and realize that you know and what I would say when we were struggling to get Blue Ridge moving and accelerate it, you know, understand that every day that goes by that we don't get another Blue Ridge up is another day that families can't reach back into the hand. Just sharing that empathy. And doing whatever you can to accelerate within your within uh, the limits that you have uh, goes a long way. It, the sense of urgency is so important. Where where I would say I was irked is where I felt like my heart was being stale. That sense of urgency. Um, and this, you know, when we sh I you know I go back to the beginning where I used the word empathy. The more that we can share that sense of um, th and that our cust uh, that our communities see it the better off we're all going to be. They're m much more willing to be patient when they see that we are trying really, really hard to figure out ways to streamline the process and uh, get them to where we think they want to go and help them get back on their own feet. Okay, thanks. Sir, and then uh, before you begin, though, we're looking for a tough question for FEMA, so that would be next if you've got something. Else. No, I think I think this is uh, something that everybody think about. Uh, First of all, I want to thank everybody for what they did in Puerto Rico. Uh, I don't think we as residents of Puerto Rico, there's only about two of us in here, I think, really appreciate what you did for us. And uh, I know the public official side was lacking in the response, but from the people on the ground, uh, we appreciate everybody, both on the contracting side and from the government side. Uh, I, I was your blue roof guy. We did the quality assurance review. Uh, 110,000 homes we walked all over the island with 250 people. We all put roofs on 57,000 people. What the balance of that is still our problem, and someday, somehow, someone will figure it out. 
but that's not the point. The, as I lived through that whole storm process, and uh, I had a contract already in place, I was ready. Uh, I found it very interesting as a contractor that I had to push myself to sell my contract that was already in place. But uh, two weeks after the storm, we ha I'm also a member of the ADC. And in the room, there were all the major key contractors in Puerto Rico there, $2 billion worth of uh, bonding capacity in that room, and they were all sitting on their hands. The question is, in this room, I don't doubt anybody. I mean, we're here, we're part of the Society of Married Military Engineers. We believe in the country, we believe in, in our nation and trying to get things. But how do we get people that don't do this on a day-to-day -day basis involved in the society and involved in readiness and involved in industrial readiness so that when something catastrophic like this happens, that they are able to respond with their capability. I mean, $2 billion worth of construction capability was sitting on their hands, ready, ready to do debris removal, ready to put roofs on, you know. A lot of that stuff, this is in October, you know, first week of October, and a lot of us didn't, were able to respond until starting, I guess, what, November, John, was when we, we really started making it happen, you know. And of course, as, as you well said, how do we get that family member, that uncle that nobody talks to, involved in this whole readiness affair so that we're able to respond better to the citizens on the ground. That's, so, thank that's a challenge not only for the, 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 to you all that, are, that have the responsibility, but to, to the society and to the uh, private sector that has to come up with a better answer because we're not doing a good job. Okay. Thank you, sir. That was a harder question for General Dorco than I even expected. But uh, in the interest of time, we're going to give him two minutes to craft his best response, and then what I'm going to ask is we get a, a 6 to 120 second wrap up from each one of the panel members, uh, and then uh, the panel members will stay here for a short time afterwards. We've got about 30 minutes in the room where you can ask questions offline, but we will wrap up in about the next two, three minutes. Sir. Yeah, yeah I mean, you make, you make great points. I mean, the bottom line is how could we have been there faster if people didn't You know, I don't think we were, we team were not as prepared as we should have been. Now, I'll, I, I could frame all sorts of things for you. But what, you know, three and a half million people, you know, in, in Puerto Rico. And our distribution center was sized because it was what we could rent and find at the time. And yeah, I'll, I'll use meals as a, as a measure of, of readiness on a daily basis. We had 600,000 meals in our distribution center. And, and when Irma went through uh, St. Thomas, all those meals went over to the VI. We had other stuff afloat, and so essentially when Maria made the landfall, you know, all the stuff was afloat offshore. We had nothing. Uh, and, and the bottom line is I don't think we, had, had, we hadn't planned well. We hadn't prepared as well as we should have. Now, today we have 7.1 million, uh, you know, stored in, in Puerto Rico right now. We have a much more robust capability of the staff there. I think the, the office there was a great group of people, but I think the lesson learned to us is in an isolated place like Puerto Rico that's se segregated from the lower 48, when you deal with a disaster the lower 48, when trucks can get there, life becomes a lot easier. When something has crossed the ocean, you got to either fly it or float it uh, to get it there. And all those variables and friction points and just the raw physics of the time it takes to sail, you know, with a trolley or a tote or a trailer driven barge from Jacksonville, you know, to the port of San Juan. I mean, that reality, I don't, I don't think that had sunk into any of our plans. Are we much better and, and ready to go right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't forget how many tarps we gave out, but you know, we were we were going from hand to mouth with tarps and with blue routine. I mean, we gave out 100,000 tarps, uh, and I'll bet you we maybe had 20,000 to start out with. Now we've got 130,000 tarps on the ground now. But you know, part of this preparedness, and what scares me is Alaska and Hawaii and Guam and CNMI, which we've lived the last couple of years, a and it's the Caribbean. And, and so we, we've got to lean deeper into this and be more prepared and have a more robust organization. In the end, it's about people. You know, what slows things down is bureaucracy and process or the lack of people to be able to drive the process to conclusion. I think we're better now. We learned some lessons. We are a lot more robust. I, I think well, the, the CAD, the, the Caribbean Area Division, had 48 people in it, I think, before the storm. Today, the recovery office over there has over 2,100. Uh, that's to do all the, the follow-on programs that are going on right now. We are be better, but we, we just have to pay the price. We have to have a big enough insurance policy in place from which we can jumpstart things 
fast enough and get there. And, and I think we're a much better place right now than we have some hard lessons left to learn. So. Thanks, sir. Uh, one quick announcement on Fed Biz Ops, and then we'll do our 60-second wrap-ups. Okay, so I think everybody's aware Fed Biz Ops is the, uh, is the place that we've always used to advertise opportunities uh, over the past several years. That's recently gone through a change now, just in the last two weeks. So if you still go out there to fbo.gov, it'll direct you to the new site. But just to go direct to the new site, it's beta.sam.gov, B-E-T-A dot Sam dot G-O-V. It's just in the last week or two that that change has happened. I want to be sure everybody got that change. Excellent. Thanks, sir. Ann, you want to lead us off? Uh, I guess I would just uh, reiterate uh, a couple things. First of all, it is it is a team effort, and um, you know it's been very gratifying to work with all the partners that we have, whether the federal government, our state partners, communities, our contractors. Uh, incredible, and, and I certainly don't mean to suggest when I went on my little passionate reaction on you know what irks me. Um, you know, I. I met a lot of contractors in a lot of different disaster areas over the last couple of years, and they are just as gratified and passionate about doing this mission uh, as well. So um, very rewarding, very difficult to do, unpredictable, hard to plan for, um, a lot of friction while it's ongoing, trying to get things moving, but incredibly gratifying. And I would suggest, like for me, it'll be one of the greatest things you'll ever do if, if you get to participate in that. To the, to the, I'll just close my thoughts on readiness. Uh, it is prohibitively expensive. Our nation cannot afford for the federal government, the federal response, to respond to everything and to be able to take care of everything. And somehow we're going to have to have an adjustment of where the responsibility lies uh, as far as readiness at the lowest level. Because if it's really, really bad, the federal government isn't going to be there for for every community to address every need. And somehow the investment and the, the culture of readiness is going to have to start resonating at a very low level, be ready to go 10 days without running water, have a generator hooked up to your house, um, you know, move away from the coastline. Things, you know, make some decisions as individuals to be better prepared. Because when it is going to be, when it's truly, not if, but when it's truly catastrophic, uh, the, the federal government will not be able to take care of the things that we've seen in the last couple of pe couple years on television. So just to pick item, a, a lot to add except for just to reinforce, this is an opportunity to be here. Don't leave it as just a meet and greet. Make sure you really make a connection and share your capabilities and I would ask for the <laughs> our district commanders and district contract managers that are here to pull the capabilities out of the contractors that are in this room because we need you. Uh, we really do. Um, there's not enough to go around. And I think it starts with, hey, I talked to somebody. They're at the small business level. I know they got capabilities. And you can talk to any of our folks. I look at our team out there in Sacramento, Los Angeles, Albuquerque, San Francisco. You know, they go direct to – you know, folks that have approached them, they've talked to them, they look them in the eye. I think I can trust you, Diane. We need this done in the next week. Seven days, we got to get out there and start removing debris from the mudslides in Santa Barbara, or we got to start doing something to respond to seeing as we try to get get people moving so we can give them a place to, to live since they're now displaced. So I would say make it uh, the most, make the most out of the opportunity that you're here, and really make a connection and persistent don't you got capability put it out there and make sure that you don't leave here feeling like you left something on the table and didn't let everybody know you had to deliver because we really need all that to, to get it done there's a disaster unfortunately that happens everywhere and so it's it's not just the you know the the Puerto Rico it's our whole country east to west uh, if there's an, an impacted area so wherever you are there's an area where you can help Today, there are, I think, 71 declared disasters here in the, in the U.S. right now. I was kind of surprised that we didn't even apply for those numbers. It's pretty amazing. I'll, I'll go back. The, the thing to keep you awake is the catastrophic. You know, the catastrophic may have happened three minutes ago, and we just haven't gotten the call yet, and, and we will two minutes from now uh, know about it. 
it's leverage in the capacity. It's worth $2 billion worth of bonded construction capacity in the disaster footprint. We have to be able to, to leverage that. Okay, in the past, we've always thought about, well, contract for this, and, and, or, or we'll have this DOD capability that's going to come and bail us out. That ain't going to happen. I believe the conversations I need to be having is you know, with Albertsons and Visa and MasterCard, you know, and Kroger and Dun and Bradstreet and all that to give me situational awareness and understand where I go for capacity. America has huge capacity out there, so we need to identify it, find it. Then we need to be able to quickly access it. Knowing that you're there, you know, that's great. Uh, knowing that, uh, you, know, you know, CNS grocers or, uh, you know, unified grocers in greater Los Angeles area have ten times, will have ten times the food that will survive the, the big one in Southern California than of all the MREs and everything that DOD and us that we, we can muster right now. How do I access that? How do I plan for it? And how do I have the contract and the tools and the relationships in place that that can be turned on? Because we've we got to figure that out. That's going to be a partnership. We've got to know what your capacity is, then we've got to figure out how we tap that. Greg, this concludes our session. Uh, I want to thank every one of you for your support to the Society of American Military Engineers. I want to thank you for participating and joining this session here today. And to the panel, I want to thank you for your expertise, your public service, for your comments today. It's been a pleasure working uh, with you in the past, all of you, and I think we want to broaden the team and bring in more to the fold so that the big one happens, and we really hope it doesn't. Uh, we're all ready to go. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the panel.